Hey guys, how's it going? It's been almost four months since my last video. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. I, I know, I suck. I neglected this channel, I left you guys waiting. So the reason for my delay is twofold. Number one is I got a job as head of engineering in this very large privately owned company. It's a unicorn company worth several billion dollars and it's preparing for IPO. For those of you that don't know, IPO is when you start you know, trading in a stock exchange. So it's obviously it's a very long, tedious process. It takes months, but yeah, maybe at some point I'll give you a little update. I can't disclose much, but uh, whatever I can tell you about what the process feels like, I'll share with you. And uh, the other reason is that I bought a PlayStation 5 and my productivity went down. So with those two things out of the way, uh, what I wanna do in this video is make things right and deliver what I promised you about the sync package in Go. And, and the way I'm planning to tackle that is to start using Go routines and, and channels and then eventually introduce when would I switch over to locks and weight groups and things like that. So let's follow me to the screen and we'll take a look. All right, so what you see here in the main function is I'm simulating a connection pool, which is basically just a map of strings, which will be IPs to this client object, which is just, you know, an IP and a fake connection that you can write to and read from. So I'm simulating clients that are connected to my server. Okay, and I'm just instantiating with these two random IPs and then you know nil for the underlying network connection. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create two go routines. One is gonna simulate people connecting and the other one is gonna simulate people disconnecting. So they're just gonna instantiate a client and add it to this map. And the same for this one, it's gonna instantiate a client and delete it from the map. And then I'm gonna iterate over all the connected clients and print them out to the console. So let's run this, see how it goes. You can see that you get a fatal error, concurrent map iteration and map write. And this can happen sometimes and sometimes not. So let's try to run it again. Yeah, you see this time it didn't happen. So the first thing you see is that we have, it's just printing these two that we have in the beginning because it's exiting too early. We're not even giving these guys a time to run. So I'm gonna start by doing this the very hacky way and I'm gonna just say sleep for two seconds to give these guys time to complete. Now this is not gonna fix any issue other than, so now it's gonna have time to complete, but of course they can clash like we saw in the beginning. If you wanna detect that, you can use the race detector. You pass in a race flag here, and basically a red race detector is, it detects when multiple go routines that are running concurrently, and really it's not, it's more than concurrently, the problem is when they run in parallel. Okay, because in parallel, you could try to modify the same piece of memory. And when that happens, you can end up with corrupt data or incorrect data. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna run it with the race detector and you're gonna see that you have several problems. Okay, number one is it found three data races. Let's tackle them one by one. So the two biggest issues that we have is that we have this guy writing to this map and this guy writing also but deleting from this map running at the same time. They need to coordinate with each other so that only one of them can do it. The easiest way to do that is to have only one go routine write to the map, okay? So either this one or this one, or let's create a third one, okay? So first I'm gonna create a client event, which is gonna be a channel of client event, and it's gonna be a buffer channel. And a client event is just an event here that you see it has an action, which can be connected or disconnected. And it has a client, which is this little object here, okay? The IP and the fake connection. So only one go routine has to modify this map or access this map at any given time. So I can do that by doing something like this. I create a go routine that is gonna range over this client events channel. And if it's a connected action, it's gonna add it to the map. And if it's a disconnected action, it's gonna delete it from the map. Now this is gonna be the only one mutating or reading from this map. So we can't do this here anymore. What we have to do is put a message on this channel. And the same thing here, right? We can't do this anymore. We have to put a message on this channel, disconnected, and this one is a connected message. So they're not mutating the map anymore. They're just putting messages here 
for this go routine to run through them and do all the modifications. So it's only this go routine that is going to be updating this chat, this map uh, at any given time. Okay. So you might think we're done here, but let me just show you that we're not, we're far from done. Okay. So you still have the three data races. Why? Well, you can tell from how short and simple this code is that it's going to obviously finish before two seconds, but go cannot. Right, so these two guys could, I could wait for two seconds and maybe these guys are taking two minutes and they're still running when this code runs. So we need to diffuse that. Let's make a done one and done two channels of Boolean and this is gonna be channel of bool. And then when this guy is done, we're gonna, in the done one channel, we're gonna put true and we're gonna do the same when this guy's done, except for two. And here, instead of just sleeping, we're going to wait for down one, and we're gonna do the same for down two. Uh, so remember, why does this work? Because when I read from an empty channel, it will block. This guy will block, and this guy will block until these guys put something in there, and they put something in there when they're done. This would be the same and it would probably be better to do in a, in a defer way, but let's just test this out. Okay, so we have two data races now, okay? We still have an issue and I'll, I'll go to what, how to fix it, but first let's address this. This kind of sucks the way that it is now. It's, it's hard to read. You, I mean, it's not that hard to read, but there's a better way, okay? So the sync packaging go gives you what is called a weight group. So let's use that. Bar. It's a sync dot weight group. A weight group is basically an abstraction that tells you, I want to wait for n number of things to complete. In this case, we want to wait for two things to complete, this one and this one. Okay, so what we can do is we can say we weight group add two. Now, let's say you want to process an array in parallel or something like that. You could, you know, use the length of the array. You can do whatever, this can be any number. Now it's two because we only have two things. Uh, and instead of saying this, we're gonna say, I wanna wait for this weight group. The way that it is now, it'll block, right? Because I'm saying, I wanna wait for two things to complete and I wanna wait for them, but I never tell them when they're done. So after this for loop completes, this function is gonna exit. So when it exits, I, wanna, I want it to call done. And the same thing here, okay? So I have to call done as many times as I said that I would add or wait for. And I'm gonna wait until both of these guys are called and then I'm gonna have two and then it's gonna finish waiting, okay? You can add more here if you want, you know? You can still add, let's add three more and whatever, but I'm just showing you this example. So let's run this again. Okay, we still have two data races, but you can see now that we're waiting for both of these guys to complete because otherwise we would have only the first two that we added in the beginning. What is the issue here? Well, the issue is that I'm trying to iterate over the whole map and print all of it, okay? Print all the connected clients. But this go routine that is mutating the map never exits because I never close this channel. So this four that is ranging over this channel is never gonna finish. I have to close this and you can tell from the code because it's very simple. It fits in one page. You can tell that that's not going to be an issue, but go can't tell. Okay. Go doesn't know. What if like in two hours an event comes in and I mutate and this guy is running and he's iterating over. So we need to tell go, uh, that's not going to be an issue. So first let's close the channel and let's make our code correct. Client event. We're going to close it. And you might think that you're done here because you close the channel. This guy is going to exit the for loop. The go routine is going to finish and then you're going to run this. You would be wrong if you assume that because you're going to see that you still have two data races. Okay. Why? Because when you close the channel, this doesn't exit immediately, right? It just puts one last thing in the channel, which is an end of file or kind of tell the channel that it's closed. But if, if you, let's say that this takes hours to process you could still process this for another hour after you close this. You can close it like at 5 p.m. and maybe this guy is still processing until like 6 p.m. So when you run this, you have no guarantee that this go routine is finished. So let's wait for that. 
Okay, so we're gonna create don channel, say make channel. And when this guy exits the for loop, let's put true in this channel. And here, after we close it, let's wait to, for the goroutine to actually finish. So now we're waiting for this. So when we're here, it means this function has exited. So we can be sure that we're the only ones reading the channel. So let's run it again. And you're gonna see that now all the racing conditions are gone and we fix our program. You know, it's easy in this ex scenario because I'm reading at the end and I'm writing in the beginning. But let's say that you need to write and read at the same time. So you have like another go routine that is going to be doing some writing, some reading, sorry. We're gonna be reading the map here. Well, you can't just read the map, okay? Because this is the only go routine that is allowed to read or write from the map. Uh, if you're trying to read while this guy is trying to write, you get a racing condition again. So we were back to where we started. So now you have to implement like some sort of, you know, maybe a case for query and you mutate your event so you can support querying and this one has to call it and let this guy read and then send back the event. It can get complicated. It can get hairy. Okay, so there's a simpler way for these scenarios. It doesn't apply everywhere, but it certainly applies here where you can say, you know what? Let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this channel. I still wanna know when, the, when these goroutines are, are done, so I'm not gonna delete the wake group, but I am not gonna use channels anymore. And I'm done with this too. Now, if you come here, this is where we started. These two are writing to the same map, so we're gonna have a racing condition again. Except that this time, we're gonna use a lock or a mutex. The sync package provides more than one type of mutex. You have the mutex, which is the one that we're gonna use now, but then I'll explain the other one. The way that it works is, I'm gonna call the, I'm gonna try to own the lock. And when I'm done, I'm gonna unlock it and I'm gonna release that lock. And I'm gonna do the same thing here. Let's run this again and then I'll tell you how that works. You see, we have no racing conditions. So basically the way that a log works, for those of you that don't know, is let's say that this guy runs first. He's gonna come, he's gonna try to acquire the lock. He's gonna say, I want a lock. Because he's the first one and nobody else has it, he gets the lock, so he owns it. So now he's able to execute what is inside here. Now let's say that while he's doing this, the second guy comes in and he says, hey, I want to lock I wanna use the lock because I wanna delete something from the map. Because this person, this go routine already has the lock, this one will block, it will wait. And when this one is done, meaning he's not updating the map anymore, he will unlock and then this guy will get the lock and he'll be able to delete. So we're synchronizing access to this map by saying, if you wanna use this map, first you have to be the one that owns this lock. And when you're done, of course, you have to unlock it. It doesn't make sense in this case, but usually when you acquire the lock, usually what you wanna do is you wanna defer unlocking so you don't forget, right? Because if you don't never release the lock, then nobody else, you know, you're gonna be stuck. In this case, uh, it, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but you can see how it works here illustrated. And that's why we don't have a racing condition. Okay, so, you can see in the first approach that you can, you can use a channel for this kind of thing, but it's probably easier, less code and more readable if you just use a lock. So then now you have a question, which is, okay, when do I favor locks and when do I favor channels? And I think that I can give you a rule of thumb for when to do either. So when you have two processes that are communicating with each other and they can pass data around to each other through a channel. So I have process A, B, C, they're all collaborating and you can share data between them, but by passing it around in a channel, most of the time that is the way to go because that is the go way in the sense that, you know, we have this famous uh, phrase from Rob Pike. I don't know if he coined it, but it's the share by communicating, don't communicate by sharing. What does that mean? That when you're communicating through a channel, you can share data in the, you put it in the channel, somebody else picks it up, the channel blocks for you, you get a lot of automatic behavior. However, when your process is n does not fit that, right? So for instance, here, we have a pool of connected clients and we want to, we want multiple people to write and read from this pool 
and it's just easier to think of it that way, then locks are just easier to reason about. So, you know, maybe you have a cache, maybe you have a map. It really depends on the process. In the cases where your data structure is really prevalent and it's just easier to have people write and read from that data structure, very narrow scenarios, then it's just easier to use logs. If you have other scenarios on where logs are better, um, yeah, I'm happy to read about them in the comments. I hope, I hope that that sort of rule of thumb is clear to you. If it's not clear, leave, it in, leave a question in the comments. I'm happy to answer it. Um, and weight groups, you know, I'm gonna cover in the future how to use weight groups to simulate sort of what you do with a single weight in Node and how the, the go way of doing that sort of async weight. And I'm gonna make other videos. When should you choose go or Node for your project? things like that. Uh, it's gonna be opinionated, of course, because it's my opinion, but uh, yeah, if you're interested in that, maybe subscribe, leave, leave a like, that definitely helps. And I'll try to make another video very soon.